The following very rare film was originally intended to promote the 1980 release of the Sperry Univac System 80. Lost in storage for over 37 years, the film has been partially restored and enhanced to preserve its historical and educational value. Portions of this film have been edited to compensate for damaged areas of the original film footage, while keeping technical information accurate to the original time period. The film features an introduction by the brilliant electrical engineer and computer pioneer J. Presper Eckert and designer, along with John Mockley, of the ENIAC, the BINAC, as well as the UNIVAC-1, UNIVAC-2, and other groundbreaking systems. The film includes unique interviews with Sperry UNIVAC engineering and technical personnel, as they describe the thought processes that went into the design of this new system. The system employed state-of-the-art multiple microprocessor architecture and emitter-coupled logic circuits. It was designed to compete against the IBM System 38, the IBM 4331, and others in its size and power class. We hope you enjoy this look back into the past. It hardly seems possible that the birth of the modern computer was only 34 short years ago. Hello, I'm Jay Press Brecker. My associate, the late John W. Mockley, and I built the great grandfathers of today's modern computers starting in the year 1946. In doing so, we introduced electronics, electronic program control, subroutines, and the age of the stored program memory. Our first effort, the original ENIAC, used vacuum tubes, as did our early UNIVACs. We later built the first commercial mass-produced solid-state computers at UNIVAC. Several generations of newer designs have occurred in the 25 years since our early solid-state equipment, and Sperry UNIVAC is now one of the leaders in the computer industry at Pioneer. Today, you are about to hear about still another breakthrough in the evolution of the computer, and once again, Sperry UNIVAC is the leader. Hello, I'm Bob Vernon. For myself and for everyone at Sparrow Univac, I'd like to welcome you to this introductory seminar on the Sparrow Univac System 80. I'm sure that you'll find this meeting interesting and more importantly, profitable. As Vice President of Marketing and Planning for Univac, it's my job determining the future trends which affect our industry. And it's my job to analyze those trends in a way that will allow us to set our divisional strategies for the coming years. 
I know that many of you in both the public and private sectors are involved in very much the same type of activity and share with me an appreciation of just how difficult prediction and planning can be. But difficult or not, we must plan for the future. At Sparrow Univac, we do see some major trends developing that will have important implications for all of us. I'd like to just briefly outline some of them and then discuss with you how I think our new System 80 can be an important element in your strategic planning and in the achievement of your objectives. It seems to me that any organization that does not approach the future intelligently and with clear purpose will fail to meet the challenges of the future and waste its opportunities. The time for complacently riding the crest of an expanding economy is clearly gone. Any organization that does not aggressively determine and control its role in the market, the economy, and in the society in general will find the 1980s a time of considerable disappointment. But those who do equip themselves with the future will prosper very greatly indeed. Here are several trends that determine the look of the 1980s. First, there is inflation. Inflation is a major and fundamental problem that affects every industrialized country on Earth. It shows no sign of slowing much in the future and threatens to be a permanent feature of our economy. Second, there is a new consumer sophistication and advocacy that will continue to demand better products, greater product choices, and better value for the consumer dollar. Third, government at all levels will continue to increase its requirements for data about your organization and mine. The problem is, how will we keep up with those requirements? Fourth, our markets are enormously volatile. They have moved geographically and will continue to do so, and new consumer preferences emerge daily. Those are some of the external forces that promised to cause us all some trouble in the 80s. I'm sure you can think of many more, especially those that are specific to your own organization. And there are internal forces as well, forces that present their special kind of management challenge within our organizations. For example, how are we to increase the general productivity of the organization? The workforce is not what it was. In most of our organizations, the proportion of white-collar employees is on the increase. We've been pretty good at increasing the productivity of blue-collar workers with automation and mechanization. But the others, the people who work with data, have not been supported with anything like an equivalent amount of capital investment to make them more productive. We all know that real gains in income and standards of living come from increases in productivity. Management must place increasing emphasis on this challenge. We must better assist our production managers, clerical people, technicians, and engineers, or any of our managers and operations people at every level. We have to move our white-collar organizations from low-productivity, low-capital concerns to capital-intensive operations in order to increase productivity and better control inflation. This combination of internal and external forces will confront managers over and over again in the years to come. Those who have prepared their organizations can capitalize on them but those ill-prepared will lose valuable time. In order to maintain control of our organizations in an environment that grows ever more complex, we will need an improved information resource to assist in decision-making, even at its most basic level. In fact, we and others are certain that for our organizations to operate effectively, information must be regarded as a business resource on the same scale as labor and capital. 
the rate of change in, in our environment will continue to accelerate. That acceleration will force us to adjust and to respond more quickly than ever before. Accounting and reporting systems conforming to the older, longer reporting cycles will have to be renewed to incorporate a more flexible, more responsive mode of operation. Those organizations striving to achieve a competitive edge in the market will acquire the technology necessary to affect increased efficiency. While these are some of the significant reasons to have a strategy for the 80s, proper tools are necessary to implement such a strategy. Tools like the new Spur Univac System 80, the product that you'll hear more about today. The System 80 is a result of years of intensive research and development. We feel it brings just the right blend of new technology and mature, proven software to the market. The wide range of storage, memory, terminals, and communications capabilities distribute easy-to-use computing power to more end-users than ever before. By its use of database information systems and inquiry languages, System 80 allows the people who use information to use that information in a way that fits their specific needs. System 80's application software speeds productivity payoffs and increases the return on your investment. System 80 is a complete value package of hardware, software, and support, and we're proud that it bears the Spur Univac name. Listen now while a member of our local staff shows you why the System 80 is more than just another new computer. Listen to how it can be the key to your strategy for the 80s. The development of the modern computer of 1980 can be traced to the convergence of several technologies developed back in 1946. Early computers had to rely on devices such as the single word register to store complex calculations. Businesses began to acquire computers in the early 1950s, spawning further technical advances. This cage and tube assembly is an example of the race by manufacturers towards smaller, faster components. The 1950s saw the phase-out of vacuum tubes and their replacement by more reliable and efficient solid-state circuitry. Transistors provided greater speed and potential power. Public and private sector demand for computers rose rapidly. By the early 60s, several manufacturers had adopted fully transistorized models. By the late 1960s, a significant breakthrough in semiconductor technology brought us the integrated circuit. The last 15 years have brought increased sophistication with integrated circuit technology. The 1980s brings the introduction of such advanced concepts as emitter-coupled logic and socketed circuits using multiple buses and microprocessors. For the 1980s, key technological innovations will establish Sperry Univac's System 80 as the newest and most advanced computer design. Improvements in computer price performance are found in the advancements made in semiconductor technology. This is true not only in storage, but also in processors and controllers. Today, Sperry Univac launches a major improvement by introducing for the first time the socketed circuit. The System 80 assembles these multi-purpose socketed circuits to form its various components. Should a malfunction occur, it can be efficiently, effectively, and economically corrected by the simple replacement of the circuit itself. 
To an increasing extent, computer speed depends on physical size. In most large-scale integrated circuits, one-third of the logic delay is within the semiconductor device, and two-thirds of the delay is caused by the interconnecting distance between the devices. A System 80 socketed circuit chip can attain speeds not possible before in systems of comparable size and type. Through the process called photolithographing, which transfers onto each chip the circuit shown on the blueprint. An additional major innovation is the use of ECL, or emitter-coupled logic, for the first time in a computer in this price range. ECL is the fastest logic commercially available. To explain the innovative architecture of System 80, let us examine a typical diagram of the early computer. The CPU was tied directly to its input and output devices, such as magnetic tape drives, card readers, printers, and card punches. Each device had to compete for access to the CPU. Later designs improved on this process by the introduction of a bus to accelerate the speed at which data traveled through the system. With the introduction of more computer workstations, diskettes, and communications lines, greater speed was a major requirement. System 80 introduces multiple bus technology, utilizing three newly designed high-capacity buses. This significantly speeds the flow of data within the system. It helps the CPU approach its full capacity. Also, the System 80 adds up to 18 microprocessors to further improve throughput. The microprocessor acts as an intelligent controller reviewing the data before it is forwarded to the CPU, greatly speeding up processing time. The microprocessor spots any error and returns it for correction and resubmission. Only when satisfied will the microprocessor release data to the CPU. The microprocessors in System 80 provide this valuable function and enhance the performance of the entire computer. thereby improving computers' availability, reliability, and maintainability. Since 1946, the mechanical calculator has grown from a clumsy device to the tiny electronic miracle of today, and the mechanical punch card accounting machines have been replaced by fully automatic electronic systems. Progress in the last decade has been made possible by the introduction of progressively more complex and faster integrated circuits. Today, this has culminated in the new Sperry Univac System 80, innovative both in technology and architecture. The System 80 provides us with speed, great software capability and flexibility, and advanced reliability. All this in a small package and at a low cost never before possible. Truly, Sperry Univac System 80 marks the emergence of another new computer generation, 
which I, as one of the original inventors, welcome with great personal pride. Today we are discussing a major news for a Univac product of the 80s. And I think it's particularly significant because it sets a tone for the new decade. Hello, I'm John Wise, and I'm Spur Univac's Director of Marketing. At Spur Univac, it's been three decades of outstanding growth since Univac 1 was developed in 1950. As Dr. Eckert indicated, that was the world's first commercial computer built for the U.S. Census Bureau. During those three decades, Spur Univac has been a vital part of the industry's phenomenal achievements. The technology film you just saw took you from the first ENIAC in 1946 to today's newest generation of computers, System 80. We regard man's technology as the critical path to continued Spur Univac success. In fact, Spur Univac invests more of its revenues in research and advanced development than almost anyone else in our industry. Underlying that R&D commitment are Spur Univac people. And today, we're going to talk to four of them who play key roles in the development of System 80. As you heard, development of this system started over four years ago. And the engineer who was instrumental in projecting your requirements for the 80s was Bill Simon. Let's meet him and learn what it was like designing circuitry that no one had yet produced, or in some cases, even thought it could be produced. Hi, Bill. How are you? Well, I know there was some technology groundbreaking that had to go on in bringing this system to fruition. Tell me a little bit about it. Well, John, our first assumption was that we could bring high-performance technology to a cost-effective range in the time that this system would be developed. When you say we, does that mean us or our suppliers or everybody in the industry? Well, it really means you know that. But it, really, it also means not just the component people, but also the system design people. Our goal was to get the system designers involved in planning what the components would be. And it worked very well. Mm -hmm. Well, when you talk about designing and miniaturizing circuitry, how small can they become? Well, they get limited, John, by the fact we have to draw them and put lines down on silicon. And we do this with light. Our lines are so small, they're only about 10 wavelengths of light apart. Is that a limitation? Or do you see a limitation coming? Well, that's a fundamental limitation as long as you stay with light. You can always go into x-rays or some other form of illumination. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things to me, though, is that you plan so far ahead. And in the company, I know there's customer engineering and software development folks who are all also developing to meet a schedule that's 10 years ahead. How do you know you're really going to make it? John, it's very exciting. We are developing a system in parallel with the technology advancement in the semiconductor industry. It isn't there when we start. We have to anticipate how fast they're going to move. Another, I guess another thing, Bill, too, that when we talk about the number of components we have, and I see them getting smaller and smaller, I assume that they become more particularized. And so what we have is a small component handling a single function. And now we have many of them, and we have to start worrying about custom engineering, maintenance, and having spare parts. Is that true with the new technology? That's the pitfall you have to avoid. We knew that if we just put our own design into large-scale innovation, we'd have many different kinds of parts. We calculated 100 different types at one time. We can't afford that. We'd have a whole system in the back room for spare parts. So what we did was we got the system designers to learn to use one type many times. We have at least 10 types as a goal of each part that we design. We actually managed to get as many as 27 of one type in the machine. That really helps the spare parts in yeah, That's outstanding. I, another item, Bill, that I wanted to ask you about today. How do you do with the, the system and new technology in a system of this size? We keep talking about new technology and going faster and faster. How do you see the, the speed in a system of the size of the system 80? Well, you see, Don, most people think of a pure performance improvement when they go to higher technology. We're looking for a cost performance improvement. The machine doesn't really need blinding speed. What it needs is effective performance at a low price. And we're trying to provide that by using the latest technology that's available to the industry. Is there anything that's impossible for you, Bill? Oh, hardly anything, Don, but if it is, we'll make it possible. <laughs> Thank you, Bill.
Let's find out just how smart the System 80 really is by talking with Paul Aspen, who is in charge of systems development for this new product. Hi, Paul. How are you doing? Paul, you've been around a long time. How does a system like System 80 evolve? Well, John, one thing for sure, we can't approach it the way we used to. It's the days of the past when you back and do what it thinks is the right thing to do. We are customer and driven just like all organizations in the Unibank. Do you think all the recommendations, Paul? Well, let's take an example of uh, the System 80 development in this past five-year period. We have received suggestions in the hundreds from our users. Some of these we can implement during this period in our existing products. Many we cannot. The point is, we get to the point where a new system design, new definition, new functional characteristics that are going to answer these user needs are required. And you have to have the new technology to go with it. So you can't just tack it on then. You cannot tack it on. That is definitely the wrong approach. You cannot get the best cost performance product in that manner. And System 80 doesn't do that. System 80 is a start from scratch development. When we talk about System 80 being smarter, Paul, what do you mean when you say it's a smarter system? Well, there's various ways of approaching that. When you take this leading edge technology, we chose to implement this in a hierarchy of microprocessors. And the fact that the typical system 80 we have is 18 microprocessors. That's not the largest system 80 by far. And having those system 80s inside that system give it, gives it that smart appearance and, and that ability to act a little bit differently than the older systems. It certainly does. Let me, let me ask the other one that's always, maybe this is kind of off the wall, but. Why does it look the way it does? I've seen it look L-shaped and T-shaped. Well, as well as humans, remember now, technology does not stop just with the circuitry. It comes outside the box. You have to trade off cost. You have to trade off human factors, which are very important, again, because of user needs. We want to have the operator available to things that are in the operator's access needs. Something, for example, a fixed disk, which exists in System 80, is not used by the operator, and therefore it is packaged in a place away from them. Many factors is the key issue. When we talk about growth, Paul, we, I guess, think of expanding and adding boxes. How does System 80 grow? Well, System 80 doesn't require that much expansion in boxes. In fact, in a basic cabinet, since we have taken this functionality, a single functional unit now is packaged on a one PC card. Mm -hmm. You can just think of that for a minute. A full I.O. control unit is on one PC card. I therefore now have endless flexibility with my I.O. and system bus structure that I can just mix and match and add these units modularly in the same cabinet. So all the, all the additions are right in there. They don't have to worry about getting more space. That is true, and that's very important in the office environment. Bear that in mind. I have another question for you, Paul. Where do the blinking lights go? Well, John, let me tell you one thing. We do not have them hidden behind a panel. They actually don't exist. We are taking the, the traditional lights and switch functions and again this ease of use for the maintenance man, for the operator, and we put them in the console functionality. The console is really a triple threat. It serves as the console, a typical console. So does the maintenance panel where you before when you were watching lights pushing switches, you now hit keystrokes and read English language answers. And it also serves, by the way, as one of our workstations. So the console comes out and tells you what's happening inside the system. That's true for the operator, for the maintenance man also. Hey, that's fascinating, Paul. And I think system development, we're quite excited about it, John. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, you're As Bill and Paul said, over four years ago, we listened to what the smaller and mid-range users wanted. That's why we're here today. In the past, Users had to make trade-offs between the information processing capabilities they wanted and the programming investment required to build an in-house system. System 80 eliminates the need to compromise. Now, small and mid-range users can have the capability they need in an easy-to-use system at a very competitive price. Along with a growing base of information, there's a need to make faster decisions through more rapid access to data when and where it is needed. To us, that means the ability to look inside the computer and not spend time to sift through reams of computer printouts. System 80 puts that kind of easy-to-use capability into your hands. In fact, as you've seen, you can talk to System 80 with commands like display, change, or even help. We 
think it makes System 80 one of the most versatile in the industry. Let's talk to the man responsible for that aspect of System 80's functionality, Ferd Bouchard. Hi, Ferd. Hi, John. Ferd, from your point of view, what's different about System 80? Well, a key feature that we see is the ease of use capability of System 80. Well, what is there about ease of use that is different? Well, the workstation, together with the uh, microcode and the software and the hardware package, but the workstation is the key ingredient for the ease of use facility in System 80. So you're not just talking about hardware when you say workstation? Oh, no. Oh, no, not at all. The workstation is a combination of hardware, microcode, and software, and the, uh, the principle that's the, that the user is interested in is workstation orientation. For instance, uh, what we have done is, with the workstation, we have moved will extend that system's operations from a single control point to many control points, which are the workstations. So it's different when we talk about a terminal, a CRT terminal versus a workstation. There is a difference between those two devices. Oh, yeah, the whole thing is integrated, you see. It's not just a terminal. That might appear, from a visual point of view, similar, but they're really not. How does it appear then to the user department when you install one of these workstations? The user has sort of a sense, it implies a sense of ownership to him. For example, the... Uh, the order entry department is initiating a program from their workstation. Mm -hmm. Now the order entry clerk can see all of the commands, all of the messages, and all of the responses on his workstation screen. And the same is true for the payroll department and the inventory department. So they actually own parts of the system. That's right. It makes it appear as if they own part of the system. What does that do to the computer link? Well, it introduces a new operating concept. I mean, they, use, they, they now really worry about resource management. They worry about if there is sufficient disk space to uh, satisfy their customers. They worry if there is sufficient uh, uh, disks available so they can... Can they see everything that's going on? Yes, yes. The, the data processing manager, he has control from his system's console. He has control. He can, he can observe the programs being executed. You might think of him as the air traffic controller who uh, tracks all activities on his workstation screen. So he can even see everything in the city. That's right. He can see everything, and he has sort of overall control because the rules mm -hmm. are needed out there. What about paper? For you often think of a computer turning out reams of paper. Do workstations true. cut that back? Yes, they do. Certainly, many of the uh, small answers that uh, the user departments are looking for, they come up on the workstation screen. We have a set of screen format services that make the, the life of the user again much easier in the using department. Sure, you still have to print reports, but the casual questions, uh, transaction detail, can be brought up on the workstation screen. You know, when I talked to Paul before, we were talking about that screen talking to me, right. coming out in the English language. Tell me about my conversation right. with the right. computer. Can I talk back to it? Oh, yeah. The uh, system 80 is much, uh, and, and the workstation, that combination is much more conversational. It makes it appear as if the, the uh, workstation talks back to you. It's, uh, it prompts you with helpful commands. In fact, the user operator has a set of uh, dialogues that help him uh, develop his job control. He has dialogues to develop his uh, data utility operations, and he has, in fact, dialogues to even do uh, systems generation. So he can really move faster in his job. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There is a, there's a decentralization of uh, program control into the user shops where it really belongs. That's where it goes. And there is a decentralization, in fact, of uh, the programming aspect of it. So we bringing up some of those data processing people. Yes, we certainly do that. In fact, John, uh, we sort of introduced the concept of decentralized decisions, which eliminates much of the interplay between the data processing department and the using departments. Now, that saves time, it avoids errors, and it frees the data processing people to perform more important tasks. In fact, this new concept brings a whole new pace to the computer room. Thank you, Perry. You're welcome. We're intent upon putting technology to work for us. Let's talk to Bill Grant, Spur Univax man in charge of making this happen. Hi, Bill. Hi, John. How are you? Well, I know you've been in customer engineering for many years, both in the field and in the design center. The maintenance is important to our customers. What's your reaction to System 80? John, System 80 is going to be one of the best systems we have ever produced in this class range. We have had reliability and maintainability in the forethought uh, for this system ever since we started on it. We talk about maintainability and reliability. How reliable is System 80? 
uh, I think is going to be the most reliable system in this class that we have ever put in two I built. Why? Because we've done many things for this system we've never done before. We have a thing called error checking codes. We have implemented both the main storage and the mass storage, okay, that will allow us to recover from many problems that used to put us down in the past. We have thread checking, which is very extensive in system 80, which will catch uh, changes or errors or you know, inappropriate uh, actions on data as it's going through the system. Mm -hmm. uh, Why do you say it's more maintainable? It's more, more maintainable because of the extent of the thread checking and error checkers that we have. We know that a problem occurs. We know where it occurred, all right? And uh, if worse comes to worse with an intermittent problem through the modularity of the system, we can replace an entire control unit by plugging in a card and working away with the defective one. You know, I talked to Paul before. We, he said that the console can actually tell us what's wrong. It's communicating back to us. How does that impact the customer engineering side? Well, we did some very clever planning for this system. Uh, our workstation controller, which controls the console, does double duty. By changing microcode, we can make a, ma a maintenance processor out of the workstation controller. We can actually use this maintenance processor when the central processing unit is down to get in there and find out what's wrong. We can fix that CPU even if it's down. So it almost becomes self-diagnosing in a sense. In a sense, it is that way, absolutely. You know, Bill, when you take a look at the system and something goes wrong with it, it only seems to happen just at the wrong time. You're typing 10,000 payroll checks and when you get to 9,999 something burps. What is System 80 doing for that problem? Well, that's one of the things that uh, we have a big advantage in this system on. <coughs> we have a, a facility <coughs> instruction we try. If it's possible to re-execute an instruction that fails, we can do it. We don't have to terminate the job or shut down the system. The same with our error correction codes in main storage and mass nice storage. Data errors that we formerly have aborted the job, uh, we can recover from. We can reconstruct that data and keep going. We don't have to shut down. I know many of us have had electronic equipment or even mechanical equipment. Or we take an automobile and you hear a sound when you're on the highway and you drive it into your service department and the sound goes away. And then you turn right around again and you're out on the highway and it goes away again and you drive back and, and you're trying to find it. It's just intermittent, it seems. Yeah. How does System 80 handle that? We've had this problem on systems in the past, but I think we've gone a long way on in System 80 to handle on that. We have automatic error logging of system errors. There is no intervention required. In problem is automatically put in the system log that we can get to and read. Uh, we have a, a capability we call trace uh, through a remote maintenance interface that our maintenance processor controls. We can put the system online to a technical expert sitting at a console many miles away, anywhere, almost anywhere in fact. Uh, we give this technical specialist the entire system's console capability to a remote maintenance interface and through trace. So it's as if an engineer is right in the room with it. Right in the room. He can pull up that error log, analyze the problems in it. He can run our complete set of diagnostics on the system lady from his remote site. So with all this information, can an operator do something as a step one? Yes. Uh, through the uh, benefits of dialogue processing and improved operator reference manuals, we can coach the operator through many of the basic steps that have, in the past, uh, resulted in a call for assistance. That's outstanding. Let me ask you one more, Bill. You've been in customer engineering for 20 years. In 20 years, what's your reaction to System 80? John, without a doubt, uh, this is the most uh, reliable and maintainable system that I've been associated with in 20 or more years. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. It takes that kind of commitment to succeed in this business. It's a fast-changing industry, growing larger and more sophisticated every day. As its principal pioneer, we at Spur Univac intend to continue playing a vital role in shaping its future. To sum it all up, System 80 combines those major factors that offer you a big plus in your next computer acquisition, from technology to ease of use to the productivity of your employees, System 80 has it all. Spur Univac System 80 is the most comprehensive value package in its price range. I invite you to move into the future with a system that is already there.